Welcome to the show. We've got a lot to cover today, like Lego Movie 2 not doing too hot at the box office. Another big bummer is what you're looking at right now. It is Will Smith as the genie, but a bright spot. We are talking about the new Aquaman spinoff, The Trench, and yeah, spoiler right here, I am super pumped for it, and I'm also really excited to have two wonderful people by my side today. Haley Fouch, John Roca. Hello, everyone. Hello. You guys rock. Thank you for being here today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Before the conversation spirals to far out of control right now. I need to say right up top, I am not the permanent host of Movie Talk. I am here <laughs> filling in until the time comes when what we're working on right now, which I think is super special and something you're going to be very excited about, once that's ready to go and we can announce it, we will. But for the time being, we do not want to miss a day of movie news here. So I will be in this chair as often as I can be. Sometimes you might find John Roca here, maybe Mark Riley. We shall see, so that's where we all stand, and we're all pretty happy to be here today because we've got an awesome lineup right up top. We we're talking about the weekend box office, which, yeah, it was a little bit of a bummer, so as I said, the Lego Movie 2 disappointed uh, big time with $34.4 million to start. What Men Want with Taraji P. Henson came in right behind with $19 million. Then it was the new Liam Neeson movie, Cold Pursuit, with $10.8 million. Then The Upside still chugging along quite strongly, took the four spot with $7.2 million. And then finally, Glass closed at our top five with $6.4 million, leaving no room for horror movie The Prodigy. All right. Roka, yeah. you're up first here. Okay. My big question for you Bring is, yeah. is this a sign that the Lego film franchise is doomed. Oh yeah, I think so. I, well, not doomed in terms of like never again, but I certainly doomed in like, let's all take a break. Let's stop for a bit. Because remember, a lot of these Lego movies went straight to DVD first for a long time or would show on the this, uh, channels on TV or whatever, the animated cartoon channels that are on TV. So you got to enjoy them that way. It was only a Lego movie that kind of upped the game and brought a bunch of uh, celebrity voices and, and, and great actors and actresses to come and voice these characters to kind of put it on the map. It was so unique and interesting and Will Ferrell was a part of it so there was a lot going for that Lego movie but then Lego Batman came out and as much as a lot of people enjoyed Lego Batman the box office didn't support it as strongly as Lego movie and then Ninjago really fell off the cliff and now you get this and we've been saying this and Haley and I I think can vouch for this we, we talked about this last uh, a few times here on Movie Talk that there wasn't as much buzz in the air for Lego movie too whether it's the when it was released or, or the, the, the fact that people are maybe kind of Legoed out or maybe even the premise of the trailer didn't excite enough people, mm -hmm. but this is certainly a sign that this movie might not make its money back, and I don't think this is the kind of movie that will have legs that will get people going for a long time, especially in uh, uh, February, so this to me, I think we just take a little bit of a break for a while, we can still come back and do something new, maybe Lego Justice League down the road, but for now, I think we should all just take a break and move on. Well, you talk about legs, and I have a feeling mm. with How to Train Your Dragon 3 coming up, mm. right. that's going to put an even firmer stop to this after this week week opening, but I keep seeing people today throw around the term Lego movie fatigue, and I don't even necessarily know if that's what it is, though. Yeah. I think that the first one was just a surprise hit, yeah. opening with almost $70 million, and then that was in 2014. We didn't get Lego Batman until 2017, and then that's when it had the one-two punch of Lego and Ninjago, but even just with Lego Batman, we already saw a sharp decline, so I do wonder if that first Lego movie was just it popped because one it was a quality film but also it was a new novelty mm -hmm. and maybe the franchise just didn't have the legs that we thought it would at that point I don't know do you interpret it differently Haley no I, I agree with pretty much everything you just said I and especially the the part where there were so many years between not just getting the next Lego movie, but like the actual Lego movie sequel. That's a long wait for mm -hmm. a sequel to a kid's movie. Maybe a lot of the kids who were into the first one aged out of it at a certain point. And I don't, you know, it's just, I don't think it was the kind of franchise like Marvel or DC or something where it already had that built-in base to begin with anyway. It was a, a surprise sensation. And then I think maybe the 
ball didn't roll as far as they thought it would for as long as it would to get these other movies off the ground. It's so unfortunate. It's like, even though I was kind of analyzing it that way in my own head from a creative perspective, I like I kind of don't get it because the yeah. animation in it is so cool mm. and it's so well mirrors that feeling of playing with Legos. And then just in terms of the creative possibilities with different characters, it seems endless, so it just seems very unfortunate whether this release date strategy is to blame or something else. It just seems so unfortunate that it is looking like the Lego movie franchise might not continue. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. I mean, I think that's the thing that uh, concerns because this is decent. This is a good movie. It's not like a bad movie. It's it's not as good as the first one, but it's certainly an, a very wa uh, watchable movie and if you've got kids, you should certainly bring them to see this movie. There's a lot here and it's got a great lesson at the end about working together and I really appreciated that about the film but maybe you're right because I remember reading a tweet uh, maybe a couple weeks ago someone said like oh I remember when the first Lego movie came out um, and now all my f friends have kids and <laughs> I just forgot it's even out that a, a sequel's coming so it's like maybe just caught at the right time caught the pop culture zeitgeist at the right time mm -hmm. made its money and this is just an anomaly and we and we probably won't capture it again and sometimes it happens with certain films okay follow up question here though maybe it is not the Lego movie and the franchise to blame because we're also in a particularly uh, weak position mm. right now with 2019 box office or overall. Yes, January and the beginning of February usually isn't high times for major blockbusters, but even compared to previous years, we're even lower. So is the Lego Movie 2 just feeling the effects of that? I would say maybe, except for the fact that the last two Lego movies did not perform up to their expectations as well. I, I do think that we're probably, I would love to see this weekend to be the one where there's sort of a turnaround in that box office trend because I really like the Happy Death Day yes. sequel and you should go see it. <laughs> um, but it's, my guess would be that's not going to happen probably until next month looking at the lineup. I think that March is really when we'll start seeing things take off. If if there's anything that I would like wager money on being the first movie to like surprise people, it might be Us would be where I would put my money. Mm. Um, I think that'll probably do really well. And then after that, we do have like a lineup of pretty significant movies coming out in March with Shazam and Pet Cemetery. Mm. There's a solid lineup all mm -hmm. month. So I think that's when we'll really start to see it ramp up. But I don't, I don't think we can pin low box office as the reason <laughs> for the Lego movie. I too. was just finding I another know. excuse to I keep like it your going. Silver you know, outlook. <laughs> my big dream is to have a Lego movie with the iconic slashers in it, which is never going to happen, <laughs> but I'm never going to stop talking about it. Well, you look at February, right? We had Black Panther uh, and Deadpool 2, or Deadpool just kind of blow the doors off the box office in February. Right. So I don't think it's about placement. It's about taste. People just don't have an affinity to go and see this sequel. I hear you with us. I hear with other... but. I'm going to throw two films out there. I cannot tell what's going to happen, but I would be excited for different reasons for them to kind of shock the box office pundits. That'd be Alita Battle Angel for mm -hmm. just for the look and production of it. Not necessarily the story, no right? No way. But the look right. and the production, you never, I, I don't know. People said no way about Venom. People said no way about Aquaman and look what it did. So I don't know. I can't tell anymore. And Fighting With My Family. That film is getting incredible reviews from so many respected critics and people here in the office who are also respected by us to go see who've seen the movie. And so I, if Fighting With My Family somehow shocks people and makes way more than people anticipated, and no one would be happier besides maybe Ryan Satin than me to see that happening for this film. So I don't know, but it would be fun to see these two shock the box office punditry. I do really want to see you fighting with my family, but the elite of the, I mean okay. I, know, I don't know All I, right. know, I can't and tell and it, it has nothing to do with because like a lot of people out there know that I've been a little negative on that one based mm. on the footage and the trailer that I've seen thus far nothing would make me happier to see the full feature and have it surprise me right. but if we're strictly talking finances and from the box office perspective right now that is yeah. not gonna conjure that box office mid-February magic I just yeah. I have this bad feeling that at least from the domestic box office yeah. that one's gonna wind up being one of the biggest bombs of the year. It certainly feels that way. It does feel that way. It does not have any significant level of buzz on it. However, never underestimate James Cameron. Yeah. I know he didn't direct it, but he has his fingerprints all over this movie, and he is sort of the box office magician of like 
three mm. decades. So we'll see. Although I'm with you, Perry, I don't think that's going to happen. But I'd never want to write off a James Cameron <laughs> film. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll yeah. find out soon enough. It yeah. is a big weekend next weekend. Happy Death Day to you, Alita. And then also, isn't it romantic? Mm. So yes. who knows? Who knows? All right. <laughs> We're on to our second story. And I am excited about this story in all the wrong ways. Um, <laughs> Disney <laughs> unveiled a new TV spot for their Aladdin <laughs> adaptation. And it gives us our first look at Will. Will Smith as the genie in action. This movie is coming out May 24th, 2019. That's a huge spot. Yet another notch in Disney's live action adaptation belt that I know a lot have high, high hopes for, myself included. Lion King is my favorite of the Disney classic animated movies, and Aladdin is right behind it. So uh, you can imagine my heartbreak last night when that TV spot just continued, and then all of a sudden it ended where it did. Haley, what is your interpretation of this? Is is it just a lost cause? Is this it, or are we going too far by judging a TV spot too harshly? Yeah, I'm hesitant to go all the way into judging. We've got mail. Oh, hi. <laughs> uh, judging something too harshly. I said this when we talked about the images. I was like, well, I don't want to judge it too harshly based on just a few still images. And I also don't want to do that based on like a few seconds of footage. But like, I don't know, guys, that ain't it. It doesn't feel like it anyway. It, it, it's a it's a. Mm. I know they still need to finish up their effects, but like for everyone who was like, well, he's going to be blue. It's fine. He's going to be blue. It, it doesn't look fine. Do they need to finish up the effects, though? It's like, I want to believe that. Mm -hmm. But then again, they just debuted a first look at Will Smith as the genie during the Grammys. Wouldn't you think that when they do something like that, they would want it as as finalized and they want would want to be as confident in it as possible? possible yeah i think that's what was shocking to me when i watched it i was like is this a joke is this, is this a fan-made trailer or is this a real trailer when i saw it the first time i got the notice on youtube i was like oh oh man i was at dinner with my girlfriend and some of her uh, family members and i'm like oh, i gotta step away i gotta watch this trailer i'm and, and i and i'm like this is this can't be real and then seeing everyone's reaction on it afterwards it was real. It's absolutely real. And I think because they messed up two things. One, Jafar sounds like uh, just a regular dude. He doesn't sound he's got he doesn't have any kind of intimidating voice or anything like that. Use was, the G word. This is the perfect oh, time yes, to use the G word. He does not have gravitas. Absolutely. I will agree with that. He didn't have any gravitas. <laughs> you're not afraid of this guy. And when he goes, your name Aladdin. You're just like, what the hell is happening here? And then when the genie shows up, it, you know, if the big complaint they had on the last time they released that one minute teaser was you didn't get to see the genie. Mm -hmm. And everyone was everyone from Disney came out and people came out and said, no, no, no they're, they're, they're going to get it right. When they get it right, then they're going to release it. And this is the way they release it. And immediately set itself up for ridicule. People already like tweeted a funny uh, uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air lines to it. I saw that meme, which was cracking me up. Um, and then, th then you see this other picture, though, that is a really well shot picture of Will Smith as the genie. That looks more believable. Why wasn't that what you showed in the trailer? And by the way, this is not Will Smith. Smith's fault. Some people are trying to fight for Will Smith. I get that. It's not Will's fault. Will was cast. He does his job. I think what's dangerous here is that people were already against this movie from the beginning with the casting. Then the idea of doing it, and you come out with these, and then the idea of Guy Ritchie, even a lot of people were complaining that Guy Ritchie was directing this film. Then you come out with these two teaser trailers or trailers, and people just aren't behind it. And no, you don't get to cop out by saying, Oh, it's just a, it's a, just TV trailer. Or it's a TV spot. But no, those are supposed to excite us about a movie. And if they're not, then they're, it's not a good thing. Yeah, but I'm hesitant to be like that. Means the movie is going to be bad. I certainly mm -hmm. don't think the marketing department is nailing mm -hmm. it. And what's weird to me is I'm even like I'm a big fan of Guy Ritchie's stuff, and like I've enjoyed, I'm one of the weird people who's enjoyed his last two movies a lot. Mm -hmm. I didn't get any of the sense of him from the trailer either. That's a little disappointing too. And I know we're constantly talking about the Disney brand and fitting into that mold. But, yeah. you know, especially looking at some of the promos for Dumbo, I mean, that's got a very Tim Burton feel. And totally. why would you hire Guy Ritchie to direct a movie like this and not let him kind of show his colors, no pun intended, with the blue <laughs> nonsense there? But it doesn't even just go for Will Smith as I, I'm so distracted every single time I look at it. Mm -hmm. 
there were other elements. I think some of the landscape shots looked pretty good. Yeah. But we actually spoke about this a little earlier. Yeah. You know that shot when he's in like the fiery cave? You know what that immediately brought me right back to? The old school Aladdin video game that oh, yeah. I used to yeah. play. The second that happened, I was immediately transported back there. And mm. yeah, that's not a compliment to the visual effects. I don't know if Abu looked right either. Mm -hmm. Like so something, something looks very, very off to me. And I know it isn't fair to judge a full feature based on a TV spot alone, but you do have to judge the TV spot as a piece of marketing material because that's what it's meant to do. It's meant to be put out yep. there to the public and encourage more people to see it. And as a huge Aladdin fan, I don't think that this trailer and this look is doing the movie overall any favors, which is why... My next question here is, do either of you think that this promo campaign could take away from Aladdin's box office, or is Aladdin the name enough to get people to see it in terms of making it a box office success for Disney? I Okay, so we also talked about this a little bit earlier, but I'll be brief. I am worried about the fact that there are two huge nostalgic 90s titles in the same year, if... if mm they were depending on that sort of name brand factor to get people into Aladdin. I could see people going, I'd rather see Lion King because that one looks really good mm. and it seems to be hitting all the right notes with people, conjuring up that nostalgia, which is the, what they want, which is what you know really fueled that Beauty and the Beast mm. box office to crazy epic proportions. I don't see that happening with this. I don't think it's gonna bomb out probably. But I, I'm a little. If I were, if I were captain of the Aladdin ship, I would be a little worried. Uh, I think it's absolutely going to bomb out. I think people like we just saw this with Lego Movie too. People, once you you get on the bad side of people, it's re in the movie going public lately. It's really hard to win <laughs> them back now at the levels that you want it to. I think it's absolutely going to bomb out. I think Lion King, because of the pedigree of John Favreau and what he did already with Jungle Book, helps that. The early trailers people have been excited about. And this, but this one has this one is really pushing a boulder up a hill by yourself, and I don't think it's going to get it over the hump. And even if they come out with a fantastic trailer, people are still going to be like, yeah, but all those other ones, I don't know, I don't know. I think it'll depend on reviews, and it'll depend on reactions to it, honest reactions to it, to see what the box office is going to be for this. But I agree with you. This is a great point you bring up here. They drop it in both in the same year. It's akin to Star Wars, mm. and who's this under Disney? Do you want a two Star Wars movies a year? Two, two like live action adaptations. It's dangerous. It's funny you bring that up because mm. this movie is hitting right around the time that Solo did. And, you know, whether or not the movie is good, it's just a very competitive time of year. Looking at this particular date, we have Aladdin going up against Booksmart, Brightburn, and Minecraft. And mm. Minecraft is a very hot property that should that movie turn out to be great, maybe that'll take away some attention from this. But then on top of that, it's being bookended by gigantic properties that could either take away some of the buzz leading into its release and then stop it dead in its yeah. Track. So this one's got its work cut out for them. And I think the only benefit that is going to come from this trailer is the viral effect of inserting Will Smith as the genie into other uh, <laughs> pop culture things. Uh, can I say one last thing? Yes. I think what may save this, if there's any way to save this at this point, is to give us scenes with Jasmine uh, and uh, what's his name again? The guy, the kid? Aladdin. Aladdin. Oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, boy. With Jasmine. <laughs> Sorry. I was thinking. Cause it, cause they give I was him being a, a smart ass. No, they give him a nickname. I was like, I thought you were going for his real name, no. uh, Mena Masu. <laughs> yeah, Mena Masu. But no, if they give us scenes with Aladdin and Jasmine yeah. and those radiate chemistry and love and you feel like, because Jasmine looked fantastic in the trailer. That's what they, and the Prince Ali number mm -hmm. that you can see from, from above looks fantastic. So if they find a way to release the trailer and it's that that sells people, mm -hmm. I think that will go along with getting people back in the camp. I also think they haven't really fully tapped into the appeal of the music yet, which is Not a huge yeah, emotional trigger for a lot of people. And it seems mm -hmm. like a weird call from a marketing perspective it's funny because i think that the lion king did mm -hmm. that so well yeah. so why not just take a cue from that i don't know it's it's a fascinating situation that's yeah. happening here and i'm really curious if it does bomb out like you think it will what that means for the future of disney's live action lineup because as of right now they are like full throttle mm -hmm. this is the future of disney's live action wing we are all in on these remakes. I mean, if you go on Collider.com, we have a list of all the mm -hmm. ones that are 
and development, and it's insane. I think the only reason I might be happy if Aladdin doesn't do well and it it puts a little bit of a of a stop or, or slight break to the Disney live action adaptation craze. The only reason I would be slightly ha- you know what I'm going. I do. By. I'm smiling. Have at you. you seen that <laughs> terrible Nightmare Before Christmas rumor that's swirling around out there? A live I, action that one. I hope that's a big pile of <laughs> of nonsense and yeah. it's not true. No. <laughs> I I don't know what that is. There's yeah. reports claiming yeah. that yeah. either they're going to do a straight sequel, which I think is a terrible idea, or they're going to go the live action route, which yeah, my especially after seeing this, yeah. my brain cannot process that whatsoever. It's dangerous because look, Pete's Dragon is a really well done movie that nobody went to. Right. Right? Beauty and the Beast people like made a lot of money. There were some issues with that. People had some issues with that. Jungle Book's the one that has mostly been universally beloved by critics and fans alike. If Dumbo and Aladdin Mm-hmm. Both disappoint, and only jo- uh, Lion King comes out of this. Of the of the three coming up, we've got ourselves a solo Last Jedi episode nine. Hopefully, saves mm-hmm. the thing kind of situation, and we'll see. For the I, record, I have faith in Dumbo from a quality perspective. Yeah. I am a little concerned about it making, you know, big budget blockbuster type numbers, right. but. I think it looks pretty good so far. It looks pretty good. And I, I mm-hmm. one thing I want to say... Although I guess Tim Burton has disappointed me a few times. His box yeah. office numbers yeah. have not been great <laughs> in the last few years. What I do want to say about the uh, Nightmare Before Christmas thing, and I, uh, I think that <laughs> maybe what happens with Dumbo and Aladdin may predict mm. the path that they take, but they are taking a path with that. I said this to you earlier. There's too much money in that title. It's one of their biggest titles for selling merchandise eventually something will happen whether this particular rumor is right right now and mm-hmm. those are the things they're weighing something eventually has to drop there what if it's doug jones would you then be back on oh board? my god i'm just saying lanky wow. tall guy good. it fits really good it fits what you he... just completely changed how i felt about <laughs> there's that there's possibilities here if it's Roca. doug jones i'm just saying oh matt uh, yeah yeah Major just, applause for you right now. What he's doing on di- on Discovery is okay. great, so yeah. add him to this. I possible. am very open to that idea. Okay. So we'll we'll table that, and we're I'm going to put that in my back pocket <laughs> for when we inevitably have to bring that story back up. Sure, sure. Um, before we jump into story number three for the day, I have to remind you that we have so much cool programming on Collider all across all of our platforms. For instance, there might have been a live episode of For Your Consideration today where we covered things like the BAFTAs and all of the nonsense that's happening with the award ceremony and how that might pan out for the Academy and the broadcast. Then there's also Millennial Must Watch, and this time, Dorian is reviewing Silence of the Lambs, which brings me more joy than you could ever imagine. You can catch that on Collider Quick and also on all of our social media channels. I think that's there's nothing else that great on there, Collider today. Nothing at all. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Yes. John Roca hosts Collider Sports Time, and he crushes it every time he hosts that oh, show. So, Roca, what did you guys talk about? We had today? Adam Caporell on this morning. Uh, he's the Complex Sports Senior Editor. We talked the NBA trade deadline, the winners and lo- losers, me, Matt Nose, and Adam Caporell. They're on the Collider Sports channel on YouTube and on the podcast channel as well. And don't forget, we had Rachel Bonetta, Fox Sports 1's Rachel Bonetta, f- on Friday as well. So go and check out that interview. Too. All righty. We're moving on to our next story, and it's yet another big one. Right now, we're talking about new reports that Warner Brothers is in the process of developing not necessarily Aquaman 2, but rather an Aquaman spinoff called The Trench, and it is said to be a horror-tinged spinoff that would delve into the title territory that shares its name with the creatures that inhabit it. This idea really, really piques my interest. I know I was not the biggest fan of Aquaman, but I do Mm -hmm. greatly admire certain things in it, especially certain ideas that I thought did raise some some interesting little tidbits that really caught my eye. And it's probably no surprise that one of my favorite parts of that movie was when we got a taste of the trench. It was so visually stunning, and it really spoke to James Wan's style for me. But I don't get the sense that he would necessarily direct this. But before we delve into that, Roka, first yeah. off, just hearing this announcement today, was yep. it a surprise to you that they were going with the trench versus Aquaman 2? Yeah, a bit of a surprise. But if you look at the Man of Steel uh, thing, same thing happened, right? They didn't do immediately do a Man of Steel se- sequel. We're still waiting on that one. We did get a Wonder Woman sequel, but that's a whole other th- situation there. But with this, I was surprised he went the route. By, but saying that, 
I'm with Perry. This was the best part of the movie for me, The Trench, because I saw James Wan do what he does best in this area of the movie, thoroughly enjoyed it, and this idea of them doing a horror with The Trench and what these uh, what these cr uh, creatures who were former what former Atlanteans, what, what they become, or one of the kingdoms, rather, one of the seven kingdoms, what they become, that excites me on so many levels. Will we get like a Gollum situation where we see how he started out to how he became Gollum like we did in Return of the King? That'd be fun to see. Uh, so to me, that excites me overall to see how the trench became the trench and what, what, uh, what that leads to. So yes, this does excite me. It's not too shocking that it immediately go to an uh, Aquaman sequel. Brilliant creative idea, I think at least here, but after Aquaman performed so, so well at the box office, yeah. is this a smart move to go this direction, especially considering this movie is not expected to star Jason Momoa? That doesn't necessarily mean he can't appear in some capacity, but Haley, is this kind of box office doom and gloom for something that's so high and hot right now? I don't think so. No, I think this is very smart. I think that and, and, uh, I'll... Straight out of my ass directly to you because I don't know anything. <laughs> but like, uh, I think that we might see something more of a lower budget for something mm. like this. I think that we'll probably see them reach into their stable of new line horror people mm. to help out with something like this. And I think that what we might see and what this might be a product of is sort of like James Wan's brain, it, like the way he spun off films out of the Conjuring verse. This feels very uh, similar to that to me. Just, mm -hmm. you know, he loves something about this universe and he wants to live in it longer and deeper and go in there and explore. I'm for it. I think it's a great idea. I think that in no way does this mean they're pumping the brakes on Aquaman mm. 2. Mm. No. I think this is not either or, it's just more. So now the question is, because I am, based on what I'm taking from this story, James Wan is not going to direct. Mm. And what we know he is very good at, courtesy largely of the Conjuring franchise, is he is very good at fostering new talent. I mean, look at what uh, David Sandberg is off to doing right now. And he's just introduced us to so many wonderful filmmakers within the genre. So, Haley, first, who do you think should and maybe even might direct something like this? So I do want to, he did not confirm or anything. Mm -hmm. In fact, he even said this is not a confirmation, but he did say on Twitter, he replied to one of these stories and said, during the early stages of production for Aquaman, I fell in love with the trench and its huh. designs and secretly hope to explore its world furthermore. Now I'm not confirming or denying this project. Um, so do I think that means he's going to direct it? Half of me says no way. The other half of me says this is the guy who did come back and do Insidious 2 when he said he was done with horror. He did come back and do The Conjuring 2 when he said he was done with horror. I think it's possible, especially because he loves his creature creation so much. That being said, I, what I do think is more likely is what I said before, that we'll see uh, Warners reach into their sort of new line sta yeah. stable of talent, and maybe we'll see, you know, like a Michael Chaves who's taking over The Conjuring mm -hmm. or something like that, or even, you know, what about Andy Muschietti? I wouldn't mind that. He's good with his creature designs. <laughs> I'm all for that as well. Yeah, I guess I'm a little torn on the subject because on the one hand, I guess it's just, it just feels, this doesn't necessarily have to be how it is. It just feels like the natural natural trajectory for a director, especially someone in his situation is, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger. But with Aquaman's success, I wonder if it afforded him the opportunity to say, hey, Warner Brothers, look at how well that did. Let me do my own thing. I mean, right. just like entirely his own thing. So perhaps that could wind up landing him in the directing chair. I remember doing the, we did an edit visit for Aquaman on the Warner Brothers lot and the room they took us in was just the second I stepped in there, the walls were covered in sort of creature designs and things like that. And I was like, yes, that is James Wan's thing right there. Mm. Let him do more of this. And that I, those are the parts of the movie that I did enjoy the, the most as mm -hmm. the one on this panel who actually really loves Aquaman. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I love those creature parts. Um, so I think that is, you know, as he said, very much a passion of his. And I, I... I wouldn't be shocked if it was something he wanted to do. I wouldn't be shocked either way. Uh, yeah, I'd love it if James did it, because as I said, it was the best part of the movie for me. But that being said, wouldn't Guillermo del Toro be an interesting thing to throw in there? Oh, he has amazing. He would be fun to do it, or uh, Bong Joon-ho would be fun. Uh, I would, or Bong Joon-ho, that would be fun to see what 
he could do with that. So to me, there's a number of directors roaming around out there that would be fun in a smaller capacity. I would say Lee Winnell, but he's already jumped on Escape from New York, so we're not gonna. We probably he's won't busy. see him coming. Yeah, yeah, he's busy. So everybody wants Lee Winnell now. So, but like, there's upgrades a upgrades just that good. <laughs> yeah, it really yeah, right is. is. Why don't you release it in 4K? Release it in 4K. It's a sci-fi film. What is wrong with you people? <laughs> anyway, um, this I think there's a number of smaller directors who are cutting their teeth uh, who would love to come up and have this opportunity to do something under James Wan. Like you said, he's now executive producer of The Conjuring stuff, so he's out there hunting for directors. In As he moves into mogul status, he should have a stable of directors to choose from. You know what? And if... if Annabelle 3 turns out to be really good. Mm. That could be a Gary Doberman gig. I mean, Ooh. Warners and New Line have a lot invested in him. Oh, mm. wow. I hope it pans out that way. Yeah. I mean, it just see, this seems like a really exciting start oh, to yeah. something new in the DC film franchise, and I can't wait to hear more information. Yeah. <laughs> but while we wait for that, we have one more story to hit, and this one is a semi-unpleasant slash, a, a, I think, personally, a good development for it. So we know that Millennium <laughs> Films recently recently announced that Brian Singer was brought on to direct their Red Sonja movie. For obvious reasons, that was meant with a, a ton of outrage and backlash and any kind of negative term you could throw at that situation. And now today, per deadline, Red Sonja has been put on the back burner and Singer's involvement is in doubt. So production on this one was supposed to begin this year, but now clearly that is not going to happen. First question I have for you, Roka, mm. is how do you interpret this story? Is the fact that it's being put on the back burner a sure sign that Singer is out, even though that's not confirmed in this report? Hell yes. And I think it's time, as we, as we talked about when we were on Movie Talk, I think last week, it's time. It's the, this is all political games that they're playing now as a studio. We're going to put it in the back burner, then we're going to quietly let Brian Singer go, then probably bring in a female director and take this thing over for PR purposes, and hopefully, maybe, because they actually think this is a good director to take over the property and the way they should go. But I think absolutely it means Brian Singer is out. I don't think the property's dead. I think they're still interested mm -hmm. in Red Sonja. Not sure how much interest, but certainly for a $10 million, $15 million, $20 million budget movie, I think Red Sonja is worth the chance you take. But Millennium Films, I think, you know, they were being a bit standoffish when people a were bit? upset about the eye yeah, and I found that to be really <laughs> That's an understatement. Yeah, it, it was they were jerk faces. Let's just say they were jerk faces for how they reacted whoa, whoa, to it. Tone down oh, the language. I apologize. <laughs> you know, and that to me bothered me on so many levels because look, I know you're a studio, you start swaggering out if you want, but people still gotta come to your movies. And people aren't gonna come to your movies if you're a jerk face. So I think the way they responded to it, maybe they learned a lesson here. The fact that they put on the back burner tells me they're walking back their comments, at least with their actions. So this is all around a good development. Singer should be buried and done with in this town. Go off and do something else somewhere else. There's enough directors. We just kicked around a bunch of directors for the possible Trench movie. There's a bunch of directors that are available to work in this town who can do a great job with this piece. And it, as I said before, it's not like Singer has a perfect record as a director. He has messed up a lot of franchises with his direction. So I, I do think this is a sign that Singer is definitely out as well. Mm -hmm. But the one thing about this story in particular that gives me pause and uh, you know I know nothing about the conversations behind the scenes I'm just trying to interpret the story mm. that was given to me today my bigger fear is that yes I think it's a good thing for the property overall if they get rid of him and go look for someone else. But the way that I read this story was not necessarily them understanding that what they did was wrong right but rather trying to defend themselves, then running into a brick wall of realizing nobody, nobody out there is going to want to work with yep. them on this project. And then they were left in a position where they had no other choice but to push pause and ultimately ditch him and find someone else. And I don't really like things playing out that way. And if that is the case, then my bigger fear for Red Sonia as a property and something that we've been talking about, it's big screen potential for years now, mm -hmm. will never happen because I do wonder if there are people out there who are now looking at Millennium Films and they're like, I don't like the way that they operate, so I don't want to work with them anymore. I obviously, this is just one person and one thing that I saw online, but I did notice today, uh, Lexi Alexander, people kept saying, get Lexi mm -hmm. Alexander, get Lexi. She's like, I don't want that. I don't, stop mm -hmm. telling me 
about this job working with people who didn't get it from yeah. the start. I don't want to work with that. So I think you are very much onto something. So do yep. you think that this Red Sonia movie is ever going to happen or because they, they have it, they have the rights to it, are we just dead in the water until the rights lapse? Oh, gosh. I, you know, I could see it still happening, but not this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that projects like this don't tend to just go away. Eventually, it'll resurface again. But it could be a rights lapsing situation where it resurfaces at another studio eventually. I don't think the project is dead, dead, though. That, that is my hope at this point, is that it goes somewhere else. Yeah, I'd be surprised if any A-list actress or burgeoning A-list actress ever takes this on at this point. And you don't want, if you want this thing to survive, the last thing you want is a C movie or B movie actress taking this thing over. It won't get the buzz that you want it to get and the message that it wants to send. I know Brigitte Nielsen did it in the 80s. That was essentially a B movie action at the time. But like, this is something you want to build up. And if you hire someone like Singer, it's because you think you've got something really powerful here to deliver. So to me, let this thing either lapse or give it some time and then maybe come back with a better presentation and someone will take a chance on it. The other possibility is that like, if Millennium Films doesn't have a lot of other things mm. going on in development right now, this could be pushed through anyway and end up one of those situations you just described, hey. like a, a B, C yeah. actor and just kind of disappears. Actors want to work. It, and sometimes oh, yeah. if it's a chance to be a lead, people will forgive their more. People will like look over their morals with a chance to further their career. We've seen this happen a number of times over the decades. So An unfortunate reality for something that was destined to be a franchise and could have been a star making vehicle yeah. for some wonderful either already established actor or just an up and comer mm -hmm. so that is a bummer hopefully they course correct <laughs> with this one um that's it for our news stories today but i'm going to remind you that at the very end of our show we're going to take your live twitter questions so be sure to send them in using the hashtag collider movie talk we got a couple more plugs we got so much good stuff coming up on Collider for you tomorrow. First up, keep an eye out for The Rule of Two with Mark Fernandez and Mark Riley. They do such a great job with that show. And of course, Collider Live, live at 10 a.m. Go see all the mayhem that unfolds over there. And then of course, we round out our day with Collider Movie Talk. We will be back here. And I'm so excited for another show. There's also a little something called The Witching Hour that <laughs> airs tomorrow. Ooh. Haley, do you want to tell everybody what we're discussing? Yeah, this week was a fun episode. That we had was. a lot of catching up to do, so we we sort of blew through topics. We talked about the new Pet Cemetery trailer, those big book changes it revealed. We talked about the Child's Play trailer. We talked about Russian Doll on Netflix, full spoilers. We're going in deep on that one. We broke a little news for you guys. We have got a full line of, oh, we've even got some more Aladdin ranting. If you needed more, we have it. Oh, there was definitely a good deal of that. Yes. And I can't, get a, I can't get enough of it in this moment, but I do hope that when the next piece of promo material drops, it is cause to stop and cause to actually look at it like a potential winner. That'd be wonderful. One you, can hope. You guys talked about it on Witching Hour, Aladdin? Because it's a horror. It's, <laughs> it's it's, it was horrific. I absolutely agree. Yeah. I the thoroughly second, agree with that. The second that it, so so the second That's that I brilliant. dropped that story in in our little movie talk uh, Slack, yeah. Thad puts a barf face, and then I told him we should be seizing this opportunity and doing some sort of mashup because that trailer calls for some sort of horror theme yep. music underneath I it. I thoroughly agree with that. I Absolutely. feel like we're in a little bit of a Christopher Robin it type situation here. <laughs> a little bit. But that, yeah, that, that movie wound up being better than what I think this is going to be. Now we have Twitter questions. All right. First up on the list here, we're going to go with... We're going to go with not Nick Field. Nick Field, thank you for sending this question about Alita, but I think we spoke about that. Nick, mm. well, all right. Nick wants to know what number do you think the movie needs to hit to not be considered a flop? Oh, 120 million. Mm -hmm. At, like just domestic opening weekend? Is just, that what you're talking about? Just, I think domestically overall, 120 to 150 million. Yeah, I know 200 million is how much it costs to make, but perception wise, I think that, because I think worldwide it'll be fine, mm -hmm. but 120 to 150 overall, I think would be good for it. What are you, uh, what are you betting on here? I'm the wrong person. I, I, know, <laughs> I know we're supposed to be like pros on everything, but I, that's not my field. I, I don't think it's going to happen either way. Um, a brief look at some overseas reports. It's saying that um, 
Battle Angel grosses $32 million worldwide ahead of its U.S. debut. I don't know in what territories they're referring to, yeah. but that does sound like a solid number, so yeah. maybe it can underperform here and still wind up being a little bit of a success or maybe just like not a massive flop. Yeah. Well, do you think this is something where they're looking to like launch a whole franchise off of this? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the original intention. I've seen the movie, so... Uh huh. Yes. That yeah. That looks like a yes face. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we have seen, without ruining anything. Yeah. Okay. Yes. We totally have seen many times in recent years that films can kind of just not do it here, and if they do overseas, mm -hmm. then a sequel can be made. Pacific I, well, Rim. To be exactly what honest, I was thinking. Pacific Rim. <laughs> and, and also. I would like to see that Warcraft sequel. I didn't even like oh, yeah. Warcraft, yeah. but I still want to see the sequel if and when it ever happens. I will say, I walked out of Alita. I w was a bit underwhelmed, but I would love to see a sequel. I would love to see them like kind of fix what might have been wrong this time around and then uh, come back to the drawing board and, and make a sequel. I would go I would go see this. I, I would give it a chance. I also just want Rosa Salazar to be a star. Oh, gosh, she's so good. It is about freaking time that mm -hmm. everybody knows her name. She yep. is so talented. Hmm. All right. Next question is from good old Rocky Drago. And he is asking, <laughs> in honor of Key and Peel in Toy Story 4, what two actors would you like to see as a duo in a future film and as what kind of toy? That got very specific. Wow. wow. <laughs> I don't think I read the very end of that question. <laughs> a duo. Uh, have Amy Poehler and Tina Fey done oh, anything? Oh, that's a like, good call. Maybe in the Barbie, maybe as like 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 progressive Barbies or whatever, some kind of version <laughs> of progressive Barbies. <laughs> like can I would just, like to see can them. Can you as please a, start that brand new Barbie? <laughs> absolutely, progressive Barbies. I look fine. I look fine. <laughs> I'm trying to think of like even another toy to introduce because I remember this question came up on a past episode where we were just brainstorming other toys and it was like the hot thing at the time. It's like when the fidget spinner first took off, mm. oh my like a, a fidget spinner being uh, being in Toy Story. But I would want to see something like super goofy, like Play-Doh come to life as like creepy figures or something. And <laughs> let's throw, who can we throw in there? Because now my mind is automatically going to Doug Jones because I want to cast mm. Doug Jones and okay wait so we're gonna have play-doh monsters mm -hmm. and they're just gonna like slime around all over the place and one will be voiced by doug jones and the other will be voiced by guillermo del toro boom okay done in yep. ticket purchase okay um i'm just gonna say a weird one let's have russell crowe and ryan gosling as detective figurines and it's an unofficial the nice guys sequel <laughs> just because i want to see that i'm into it i'm yeah. into it if we're not yeah. going to get a nice guy sequel yeah, exactly. i will take that in exchange <laughs> right. all there. right this next question <laughs> is from neil varma who asks with the trench spinoff what horror marvel movie would you like to see Mm. Ooh, big question. question. Big question. Roka, I feel like you know the Marvel properties better than the two of us. Is there anything buried in there? Uh, sure. Um, damn, there's a lot of dark stuff. Uh, it, mm, I don't know. I, it's tough to say because they don't really do a lot of combo horror stuff. But like, if you look at Marvel, there's a lot to explore with. If they ever got the Dark Phoenix storyline right for the X Men, <laughs> that would be a fantastic horror if they went through it because it's got clones, it's got time travel, it's got babies in peril. There's a lot of horror that's attached to that when you look at, uh, or even so, if you if you did the horror aspect of Silver Surfer being tied to Galactus and being forced to kill multiple civilizations on planets in service of Galactus, that's a possibility mm. as well. So there's a lot to explore horror-wise there. Or if you did the original Old Man Logan, which is where Wolverine gets brainwashed into killing every single mutant on the planet Ooh. and he has to live with that guilt uh, which is what they reversed around with logan they had professor x yeah. phantomly possibly do something that killed all the avengers and all the x-men in old man logan it's wolverine who's killed everyone because mysterio has f flooded his brain and he so he's turned them all the head of friends into enemies and kills all of them i did That's not a pretty realize horror. it was that dark yeah it's pretty dark old man logan yeah <laughs> what you got Haley? Um, 
I feel like this might be the most obvious answer, but if it ever happened with the actual like Avengers cast, which it never ever would, I know I'm not a <laughs> total fool, but if it did, it would be the ultimate dream if they did Marvel zombies with like oh, yeah. the actual Avengers <laughs> cast and like a little zombie Peter Parker played by Tom Holland. That well, that's amazing. a little like the uh, the Star Wars book, Death Troopers. It puts a little bit of a zombie spin uh-huh. on Star Wars, which I'm fascinated by. My answer to this, though, is just let Josh Boone make his new mutants. <laughs> just let him do it the way he wanted to do it. That's a great point, Also, um, on Mailbag last weekend, Jeff Snyder dropped a little like tidbit that he's heard around and it's that this Black Widow movie will likely be R-rated and mm. that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a horror movie but the thought of a Black Widow calling for an R-rating suggests to me that they might be uh, exploring a more violent path for that character which sounds a little strange given the fact that she's so well established in the current MCU but also a little intriguing to me. I could see it going, you know, like a psychological existential horror route. Oh, no, that's a fair point. Yeah. Maybe maybe that is what they have brewing. <laughs> All right, let's do, I think we could squeeze two more questions in. Okay. This one comes from Grant, who's asking, thoughts on the four Oscar categories being axed from the televised broadcast and set to be given out during commercial breaks. They are cinematography, editing, makeup and hairstyle, and live action short. I know we're not supposed to pound the desk, but I want to bang it so bad. Mm. Hard nah. What is this? That's what is this nonsense? Cinematography? Yep. Makeup and hairstyling? These are some of my favorite categories that like, I get really intensely editing. into editing. Yeah, yeah and no. I, I thoroughly agree with you guys. I think it's the most ridiculous thing in the world. It's one freaking night. Come like, on. bite the bullet and just put on something. Who cares about the ratings if it's one night where we worship the art of film, which so many of us have grown up loving and has influenced us and taught us how to be in the world and opened the doors of perception to us about the world and made us think anew about certain things to give it the time and the love it deserves. You remove cinematography, most of those montages are put together because the cinematography in those montages is so incredible. The editing is incredible. The costume, the design, the makeup, all of that is incredible. So to me, I push back on those people who are like, oh, people only watch for actors and directors. No, you watch for, those of us who love movies watch for everything and I guarantee you, removing those categories will lose your ratings right. then get you ratings because those are the ones where you kind of really dive in and people do the Oscar pools. Those are the ones that are the difference between winning and losing sometimes is getting those categories right. So to me, I think this is a phenomenal mistake. At this point, just do it in the Roosevelt Ballroom and don't put a damn camera in there and let's just be <laughs> done with it because this is ridiculous. You're, you're butchering something that for me, since I was 10 years old, was one of my favorite nights every year. And to do it this way, I think it's just the it, You're cannibalizing it. It's the worst. I agree. I'm, I'm so upset. Imagine not seeing Roger Deakins finally take home right. that Oscar. You didn't get to see that. Imagine not seeing Suicide Squad take home their Oscar. <laughs> well, it's also, it's not even just, so I, I'm not sure if this is, because I haven't read the full report yet, and we did FYC today before this had actually broke, but I believe originally they had said that they would, you know, package them together and release these clips online. So you will eventually get to see it. My problem with them taking certain things out of the actual broadcast is, they're obviously never going to do it with best picture or any of the acting categories where the famous faces are. And yes, I know we're talking about ratings and you want to drive people to watch your show, but we also have the integrity of an Oscar statue to protect. And I think that a decision like this basically says that acting statue is more valuable yep. Yep. than that cinematography statue. And that I think that's a major problem with the industry overall, which is why as often as I can, at least, I try to sit through credit it's because every single one of those names on that screen is part of that production. And yes, you have a director who's at the helm and has to steer everybody, but there are so many people that work so hard on these movies. And the fact that this sends the message that someone's work is more valuable than another's mm. is very, very upsetting. I think I came up with a semi good fix to this situation that we further discussed on FYC today. So go back and check that out at the end of that episode. I'm not going to rehash the whole thing here, but man what a colossal disappointment this news is i i hate it and like yeah maybe they're putting it online afterwards no not yeah. the same and how many people are gonna go watch that even like as someone who really cares sure i'll watch it but it's gonna be like annoying to do that the grammys don't do this 
The Grammys don't effing do this. They'll go three and a half hours. They don't give a crap. And their ratings are comparable to the Oscars ratings. So to me, it's frustrating overall. Do they give out awards off camera, though? I feel like they Je- do it for Jeff- yeah. technical ones, right? But not okay. like, uh, you know, like in all these other categories, they give out, you know, producer of the year. Mm-hmm. That's editing. You know, those kinds of things. That's involved. Producing the, the you're producing the beats, you're mm-hmm. producing the music, you're cutting it down, you're adjusting. That's all editing. So to me, I think it's phenomenal how uh, ridiculous this all is. This is going to be one. One heck of a ceremony this year. Oh and you know what? Even if it is a big mess, we're going to be here with you. We're going to be here <laughs> all Oscar night with a pre-show, post-show, live stream, hopefully. We want to share this Oscar, uh, I guess this Oscar night uh, experiment with you guys. Yeah. So that's going to be interesting. I want to thank Haley and Roca for being here today. You thank guys you. made this such a pleasure and a treat. A thanks, as always, to Adam in the booth. We can't do this without you. Thank you guys so much for watching let's cut to the wide to say goodbye tune in tomorrow 4 p.m pt for a brand new episode of collider movie talk